Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You, the quiz show in which contestants get the chance to win a million pounds as we bought them all lottery tickets. <laughs> in the news this week, to celebrate polling day for the new Scottish Parliament, the SNP blow their entire election budget on a fireworks display. <laughs> Despite his scathing attack on their new hatchback, Vauxhall kindly invite Jeremy Clarkson to test drive another model. And at Washington Zoo, keepers unveil their latest attraction, Monica the Elephant. <laughs> On Ian Hislop's team is a journalist who believes he was only hired by the Daily Express because they confused him with his brother... Cr oh, I think it's just happened again. Uh, anyway, he's here now, so Peter Hitchens. Good evening. Good evening. And with Paul Merton tonight is a woman who has apparently eaten everything from squirrels to testicles. In fact, the only thing left in the BBC canteen is a couple of mushroom volivants. <laughs> Clarissa Dixon Wright. <laughs> so, beginning with round one, fools no one. Ian and Peter. Well, I think it's the sixth week of the uh, war to save the uh, Kosovo Albanians from the Serbs. But unfortunately, the Serbs are still killing the Kosovar Albanians and driving them out of their homes, so it hasn't been a very successful war. But, but I think it's about to be proclaimed a success. Right, right. If yeah. I have that right. And what's the, the UN proposal at the moment? Uh, the UN proposal at the moment is that a lot of Russian troops will come in, surrounding the NATO troops, so they can't do anything, presumably. <laughs> and what's Tony been up to? He's been visiting the refugees, mm -hmm. um, making a speech, saying victory, um, and they're going... We don't speak English, but he sounds good. <laughs> they're going, Tony, Tony, Tony. And so he thinks they're all Labour MPs. <laughs> <laughs> and showing that his deodorant doesn't work. Gosh, I didn't notice that. <laughs> I think it's quite warm out there. It's probably reasonable. <laughs> you haven't seen the Shore adverts or whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> we might have a tick on his back. We don't know. <laughs> he was called by the press the Pied Piper of Kosovo. It's an extraordinary title for Blair, because the Pied Piper took the rats away from the honest citizens, whereas NATO has managed to take the honest citizens out of the country and leave all the rats in there. <laughs> and what's the new weapon that uh, they've unleashed on the well, Serbians? The, the Apache helicopter, which is named after a group of people who were ethnically cleansed by the United States Army. <laughs> I wasn't actually referring to that weapon. There is another weapon. Uh, oh, is this the, the thing that turns all the lights out? Yeah. This amazing graphite bomb that you drop over the power stations and then the electricity doesn't work. My Electric. electricity board's got one. <laughs> <laughs> we can see it now. Well, why have they spent six weeks dropping cruise missiles when they had this up their sleeves all along? Because they spent all that time sharpening the pencils to get the graphite. <laughs> <laughs> NATO this week used so-called uh, soft bombs to disable Serbian transmitters and communication centres as they have accused Slobodan Milosevic of controlling the country's media, something which he denied on last Saturday's edition of Slobodan's house party. <laughs> Paul and Clarissa. Uh, Donald Jewett, will you be my girlfriend? Will you be my girlfriend? <laughs> Alex Salmon. Oh, uh, yes. With He's... Sean Connery bluffing. Yeah. It has to be the Welsh and Scottish um, devolution elections. Have you already voted? Because you live in Scotland, don't you? I live in Scotland. I voted at two minutes past seven this morning. Oh, right. So that I could be here in plenty of time to eat out the BBC canteen, you see. <laughs> Peter, you're normally fairly busy around election time, aren't you? Yes. Mm. Roughing people up. <laughs> <laughs> when are you spending the last election hounding Kinnock? The one before the one before I hounded mm. Kinnock. And the one after that I hounded that nice Mr Blair, the most wonderful man in the world. <laughs> you're, not allowed, you're not allowed to hound. But no. I did. I got into terrible trouble. The Labour Party came after me, and they revealed my past. But what is so, your past? My past? Well, I used to be a Trotskyist. Good heavens. What well, who knows, by the end of the show, Peter could be on Paul's team. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you got any... <laughs> what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> Swinging from side to side. Um, it's a... <laughs> political metaphor, Paul. I think. I don't think so, the way Good. he's got his hand on my knee, yes. <laughs> this 
Mr. Sir, I've been blessed. <laughs> uh, yes, it is the local elections and the uh, regional elections for the new Welsh and Scottish assemblies. Uh, unfortunately, this show is recorded before the results are announced, so we have no idea how Labour, the SNP or the Liberals have done. But the Conservatives have done very badly. <laughs> Ian and Peter. Oh, that's British Airways with the tartan um, tail fin. This is the uh, stewardess who, when the plane arrived early, ran around the aeroplane with almost nothing on except a fluorescent orange jerkin and a hat to pay off a bet. Now, if the plane had arrived late, what would the captain have done? <laughs> If you go by what the papers say, it's slightly confusing, I have to say, because according to the Telegraph Times, Mirror and Express, she was a dark-haired flight attendant. Uh, the star, however, not only described her as a 27-year-old leggy blonde, <laughs> but also provided us with a picture to show what she may have looked like. <laughs> and, uh, and this is what she did actually look like. <laughs> Any idea what the captain's name was? The captain's Captain name. Captain Peacock. Uh, <laughs> Captain Pugwash. <laughs> Captain Ash was his name, which is a slightly unfortunate name for a pilot, especially if your first names happen to be Christopher Ronald. Um, <laughs> were they? <laughs> oh, yes. Those were his names? No. Um, <laughs> Why are you mentioning it, then? I just, I'm using conceit, I thought, but maybe not. Yeah, not, I think. Probably. <laughs> Frederick Leonard, that's Flash. Mm. <laughs> well, I don't say that, do I? So why are you wasting everybody's time with this ridiculous... What's Christopher? What are you talking about? What's ironic about a pilot having a name Flash? Well, because she well, did a strip. Well, she took clothes off. She took her clothes off. This is the uh, British Airways stewardess who lost a bet with the pilot that the uh, plane would arrive late and had to strip off down to her underwear and run around the plane. The baggage handlers were so stunned that several valuable items of luggage got through unstolen. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Paul and Clarissa. Uh, Mount Everest, clearly. Um, Mallory. Mallory, yes. They've just found his body. Mallory climbed up, with, uh, climbed up Mount Everest not 2,000 feet from the summit and, and, they, and, and didn't go any further, or so they believe. They don't know. They've got to find a Kodak camera that he had about his body. If they can find that, if there's a picture of him standing like that doing that, <laughs> then they are the first people to have conquered Everest. If not, then um, they're not. Mallory went up in a tweed jacket and hobnailed boots. Mm. Hardly stylish. <laughs> Mm. The chaps didn't wear anoraks. No. Well, but don't forget the plus fours. Mm. According to certain he photographs, uh, chaps don't wear very much at all. Mm. Ah. <laughs> that is uh, George Mallory. He had a habit of, of walking around the lower slopes naked to relax. You don't say. Which is perfectly reasonable. He was a typical product of his time, an upper-class English school public school boy. Right. <laughs> well, the more worrying, I think his companion is also naked from the waist down. Is he really? <laughs> Nothing unusual about that, Ian? No, he was at Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> and who else has tried to climb Everest over the years? A few other Brits. Uh, Brian Blessed. Yes, about 900 times. Uh, uh, Chris, Chris Bodden. <laughs> yes, and more famously, uh, the Duchess of York attempted it. When? Oh, Lord. <laughs> How far did she get? As far uh, as the nearest cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> she got 20,000 feet up before. By uh, helicopter. <laughs> or by a passion. By Budgie. <laughs> <laughs> Budgie the helicopter. Uh, this is the discovery this week of the uh, body of George Mallory on the slopes of Everest. Uh, the discovery of the climber wearing a tweed jacket and hobnail boots it hasn't proved whether he reached the summit, but it has proved that he was a lesbian. <laughs> so, uh, at the end of that round, the scores are like a Cornish brother and sister, frighteningly close, being as they are for all. <laughs> And so, just as things are getting going, in tribute to TV executives everywhere, we break suddenly for a four-course meal. Four <laughs> unsavoury news stories to identify from four even more unsavoury foodstuffs. So, uh, Ian and Peter. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
melons. <laughs> yes. Now, this is actually about Britain's fine new universities, at least I think it is, and some really serious research which they have done, which suggests that when women go out to the shops and buy melons, they're influenced in their choice of melon size. Well, how can I say this? <laughs> By their own physical attributes. <laughs> and um, so presumably uh, some women buy these and some women buy these. <laughs> have, have, I, have I got any more? Have I got completely the wrong answer? No, but just and put, put the <laughs> lid back on. <laughs> yes, I, I'd love to say you're completely wrong, but uh, unfortunately you are utterly right. I just wonder what the selection of cucumbers is. I can't get it in the basket. <laughs> so you know, usually they sell them cut in half, don't they? <laughs> yeah. That's kosher. <laughs> so how do you test a melon then, uh, Clarissa, to find out if it's ripe or not? You smell it. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, have to open it before you smell it? No, no, you just hold it. Do you want to hold that to your nose and see what happens? Oh. <laughs> I Can I just the ring the England test thing. selectors? <laughs> <laughs> that's right, you smell that, don't you? Right. <laughs> this could be a new program oh, called Melon Snip. <laughs> It's a melon sniffing. <laughs> Lord Helsham, would you like to serve him? <laughs> uh, a Tesco spokesman said, for most women, breast size is a conscious thought when choosing melons, whereas for most men, breast size is a conscious thought when doing almost anything. In fact, <laughs> uh, Paul and Clarissa, uh, your main course, bon appétit. Mm -hmm. Un, deux, trois. Ah. This is the meat pie, that's Norwich City. City. Delia. Um, Delia Smith. Mm -hmm. Delia she... Smith said that um, she's a director of Norwich City. And she said that um, they were going to do away with the meat pie image of soccer and have designer food for Norwich City. Oh, look, he's got a little. Oh, look. Ooh. Ooh. He's <laughs> little... been hanging around. You can have an act for this. Hello, what's your name? My name's Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby the talking meat pie. <laughs> Makes your melons look a bit sick, doesn't it? <laughs> Not often you get to say that on British television. <laughs> um, it's about Delia Smith meat pie. She doesn't like them. She's going to change the food at Norwich City. Are you rivals, or is it Not at all, no. I'm friendly? a great fan of, friend of Delia's. She's, Just checking. She's given um, more people the uh, confidence to cook my recipes than anybody else I know. <laughs> <laughs> Ian and Peter, your uh, side order. Help yourself. Uh, there's a uh, part of it that I have to give you as well. Oh. Sorry, there we are. Thank you so much. I don't think this is this week's story, but there was a story about a research done into potatoes, which had Clarissa's obsession, genetically modified food injected into them, and then they were fed to rats, rather like this. <laughs> this <is> so well. <laughs> and then it's quite the rats... scientific the way you do it. <laughs> I could do tomorrow as well, next. And then the rats <laughs> did that. <laughs> and the professor published this research, and then a whole lot of other um, professors tried to um, sit on it, because the results are embarrassing. It suggests that sort of genetically modified fruit might actually kill people. It's Professor Arpad Pastai. Very good. And of course, you know quite a lot about this because he was actually at Aberdeen University where you're a rector. Well, well yes, that's true. Oh, sorry, you were talking to... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yes, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Yes, we know it's right. We've got a photograph of you here. <laughs> that's, that's me on Angus. Angus the Bull, it's called. Oh, thank God. <laughs> You sure yeah. it's called Angus the Bull? Yes. That's, that's short for Angus the Bullshitter. <laughs> <laughs> and what was Blair's reaction to it? He said, Look, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said he'd given them to his kids. He sort of did a gummer, didn't he? Oh, really? Mm. But he's in a slightly odd position because he's got David Sainsbury in his government. And Sainsbury's are quite involved in genetically modified food. So there could have been a conflict of interest, except it's Tony. 
and he doesn't have conflicts. <laughs> And there are some strange examples of modification. There's even a type of corn which glows in the dark, apparently, because it's had a phosphorescent gene in it or something like that. And they, they, they su suggested that in America it would be perfect for lining airstrips, you know, because you didn't need torches in the dark, you'd have the corn. <laughs> That's true, apparently. But then birds would eat the corn, and then you'd have glowing bird shit all over the place. <laughs> That's the whole problem, yeah. The top, the top of Nelson's column would be like a beacon for airplanes. <laughs> It is the, the story of the genetically modified potato, uh, which was fed to rats by Dr. Putsai. Uh, there was an immediate outcry against the experiment. Uh, Dr. Putsai's conclusions remain unproven. It's got nothing to do with genetic modification, said one of the rats. <laughs> in their defence, GM giant Monsanto say they've spent millions in research and as a result are fully aware of precisely which government ministers will turn a blind eye. <laughs> and finally, Paul and Clarissa, uh, your crackers. Thank you. Ah! Jeez. They're nice. Mmm, have a bit. Oh, I Very good. Uh, I was just going to say, don't eat, but... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're not genetic. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's blue cheese. Well it's, done. It's um, Dolce Lata, Roquefort. Uh, it is, in fact, Stilton. Well, it's been out an awfully long time. <laughs> <laughs> is it the cheese rolling competition? They banned it, and now it's back again. Or something like that. But anyway, there's a cheese rolling competition. Is the right answer. No. Oh. Yeah. And in fact, we can have a look at the cheese rolling competition now. <laughs> oh, look. Well, a passerby could have been hurt. <laughs> and if you want to see more of that cheese rolling event, it's the main item on this week's grandstand. <laughs> As we call for the bill. A uh, quick look at the tab shows that uh, Paul and Clarissa uh, may have to consider doing a runner, trailing as they are 10-8. Okay. So to round three, and odd one out seems the only serious contender for the title. Paul, Princess Anne, mm -hmm. Ivana Trump, yes. Mingus Campbell, and Bobby Davro. <laughs> Oh, right. Uh, Mingus Campbell, he's the Liberal, isn't he? Um, he's, he was an Olympic runner. Might have been. Princess Anne, she's an Olympiad, Olympian. Mm -hmm. um, Ivana, there's an, she was in the Olympics, uh, Olympic sport of shopping. <laughs> and Bobby Davro wasn't ever in the Olympics, so he's the odd one out. Is the right answer. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Rather annoyingly quick. Um, Why so, annoyingly? Uh, because, obviously, I like to, you know, experience a certain amount of discomfort on your behalf. Um, You'd like to experience discomfort on my behalf? <laughs> <laughs> that's, awfully, that's awfully bold of you. <laughs> Why do you experience discomfort on my behalf? So if I go in there and have my hemorrhoids done, you have something shoved up your ass. <laughs> and I don't have to have the operation. That's Mind right you, you wouldn't be able to hear what you were saying, though, would you? <laughs> The answer is that they've uh, all competed in the Olympic Games, apart from Bobby Davro, although his father, William, uh, was a 1500 metre runner who competed in the 1948 Olympics. Bobby Davro recently admitted he had a phobia for anything with eight legs, which means he's often scared of his own audience. <laughs> Uh, during the 1972 Olympics, Princess Anne competed successfully in the show jumping event. In fact, the judges said she finished with only two faults. She's got wonky teeth and drives too fast. <laughs> Clarissa, a Range Rover. £20,000, half a dozen lobsters, and Kevin Keegan. Live lobsters are very good. You can smuggle them through customs and then threaten to kill them at the last minute. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondered what you did on your days off. <laughs> well, I had these lobsters, you see, and they were alive, and um, they'd been in the hold, and they started scrabbling. And the man said, um, those are alive, you can't bring those in. So I said, could I bring them if they were dead? So he said, yes. So I started on buttoning my brooch, you see, and he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to kill them. And he said, not in front of me or not. So I took them in. Uh, anyway, that's got nothing to do with... Um... <laughs> How Correct. do you kill a lobster with a brooch? You don't, but you... it's a good, good bluff. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pin this on him, he'll die of embarrassment. <laughs> anyway, I think it's something to do with that man who didn't get the passport today. Mohammed Al-Fayed. 
uh, because he gave, what's his name? Oh, that thug. Um, Norman Tebbit. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Norman Tebbit, a, a Range Rover, didn't he? The £25,000, wasn't that the Hamiltons? It was Tim Smith. And the lobsters... They were a gift to somebody. He gave somebody a gift of lobsters, didn't he, as well? But Alf had said, I will give Kevin Keegan to the nation. But everything else he gave to it, he gave away. But he hasn't given Kevin Keegan away, apart from the nation. I reckon the odd one out is Kevin Keegan. Is the right answer. Very Three, good. well done. <laughs> I can say a lot of things about Alf Hyde, but I'd probably get sued, so I won't. Oh, what kind of things? Well... <laughs> My father had a lot to do with Egypt, you see. He built oh, the yes. Anglo-American hospital in Egypt, and um, for once, Jack Straw was quite right. Oh, really? Mm. You, you think know. he shouldn't have had a passport? Mm. There's a controversial view. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you know Jack Straw as well? Yeah, I was uh, um, at Gray's Inn with him when I was a law student. Mm. And he's a poacher turned gamekeeper, really. In what way? Well, you know, I, I, I'm rather mystified by all these allegations about never having touched Wacky Backy and things like that, because obviously my memory has been damaged by all the alcohol I drank. <laughs> Are you Are saying he was a member of the High Court? <laughs> <laughs> eh? <laughs> oh, intriguing. Did uh, he inhale at all? <laughs> what? <laughs> I told you my memory's been terribly damaged. <laughs> yes, evidently. Because it sounded as though you were about to reveal that he used to be a bit of a dope smoker, but... <laughs> I think it's probably just my hearing, is it? <laughs> Almost undoubtedly, your hearing, yeah. yes, yes. Mm. Mm. That would be quite interesting. <laughs> it would have been, wouldn't it, yes. Mm. Yeah, what a shame it's not true. Uh, Mr Fire told the uh, Sunday Mirror how he lured Kevin Keegan to Fulham FC. When he came to see me, I just told Kevin, do me a Newcastle. Whereupon <laughs> Keegan smashed a bottle and shoved it in his face. <laughs> in an interview with The Independent, Al Fayed was asked if he read Private Eye, uh, to which he replied, I do not read Private Eye, but I'm told I feature regularly. It's nice to be popular. <laughs> He really doesn't read it, does he? <laughs> Along with so many millions of others. <laughs> yeah. Ian Anne Whittacombe, Clarissa Dixon Wright, Greg Dyke, and Martin Bell. Um, only one of them is a Klingon, Mr. Dyke. Look at him. <laughs> I think this must be a BBC answer that he might become um, Director General of the BBC. <coughs> which would make him out of those four the only person who hasn't actually worked for the BBC. How about elections? Explain. Well, um, I was elected rector of Aberdeen, and Anne Widdicombe and um, Mr Bell are both elected members of Parliament, and you don't get elected to LWT. But the correct answer I'm looking for does concern one of your habits, certainly. Alcohol. Um... <laughs> They all like a drop, except Clarissa, who likes an ocean. <laughs> like to... <laughs> uh, no, it's not that habit, actually. No, right. It's a different habit. Uh, I've never been to bed with any of them. This... Not even old... Um, no, men. not yet. <laughs> Mind? I'm strictly heterosexual. It's Surely something... she'd tempt any woman. <laughs> even when it's strictly heterosexual. Yes, right. What's the answer? OK, I'll tell you. The answer is that none of them have televisions. Uh, except for Greg Dyke, uh, who is current favourite to become Director General of the BBC. Do you and, not have a television? Uh, no, I don't have a television. Why on earth would I have a television? No, good for you. Good for you. And Anne Whittacombe doesn't have one either, although despite that she did appear on Call My Bluff recently. Uh, shame you didn't catch it, Anne. You were appalling. <laughs> As one of the controversial two fat ladies, Clarissa Dixon Wright apparently insists on using nothing but the best quality butter, although on a good day she can squeeze out of the sidecar without it. <laughs> I'll see you in the car park. <laughs> And finally, Peter, Jerry Halliwell, Peter Mandelson, Captain Oates, and the Terminator. Only one of them is dead. That can't be it, can it? The odd one out is dead um, because he said he would be gone for some time. That's Captain Oates. And he yes. didn't come back. And all the others are trying to come back or have come back or want to come back. All the other three said, I'll be back. And he didn't say that. He said, I will be some time. 
is the right answer. Well, very good. Within weeks of his resignation, Peter Mandelson was being advised by Gordon Brown on how he might make a return to the political front line, uh, according to the Times. Gordon Brown has discussed the possibility of Peter spending some time in Tanzania involved in charity work. <laughs> Although his actual words were, why don't you piss off to Africa? <laughs> Which, uh, cheap return, uh, brings us full circle with uh, Ian and Peter. Uh, back to their worst, behind as they are, 1311. Oh. Missing words is the rather blunt description of what the following round and indeed headlines contain. So, to your marks, four. Drama over farmers what? Llamas. <laughs> Drama over farmers' wife's assault on blind mice. <laughs> Just went at them with a carving knife. Um, llama is closer, uh, given that it is, in fact, the right answer. Barmy llama. <laughs> I had a llama named after me once. What was it called? Clarissa. Oh. I mean, what was it called? <laughs> uh, next, what gets adulterers off the hook? Lying to Congress. <laughs> Having a beard and being foreign secretary. It's fa <laughs> It's a new phone service that you can Your dial. Alibi on. services. Yeah, that's it right. is. Is the right answer. Alibi service. That's right. Next, uh, kangaroos put on what? Bears and graces. <laughs> Trousers. Woolly jumpers. Put on weight. Put right, on trial right. in kangaroo courts. <laughs> <laughs> put on the pill is the answer. Oh, fair uh, enough. Is female, Why? female kangaroos uh, for self-preservation. Uh, all across Australia are now on the pill, or at least they say they are. <laughs> uh, and finally, Mason's face what? Inquiry. East. No, it is in fact legal register is the answer. Yeah, you can't be a Mason and a Catholic. Yeah. You're a woman too. <laughs> you could be a Masonette, surely. <laughs> Uh, which unlikely stories mark the end of tonight's pure fiction and the truth of it is that this week's little porkies are uh, Ian and Peter with 14 whilst this week's couple of whoppers are Paul and Clarissa with 16. Ooh. And I leave you with news that in Amsterdam the chairman of Monsanto denies that genetically modified foods can have adverse side effects. <laughs> And finally, at a hotel in central London, last year's champion congratulates the winner of the 1999 Git of the Year Award. <laughs> Good night. The only four-letter word that scares Rabsi Nesbit, work, and it's coming his way on BBC Two next. On BBC One, Silent Witness in five minutes.